Section 1 of Bismarck. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Bismarck by Georges Lacour Gaillet. Translated by Harriet M. Capes. Chapter 1 Years of Preparation. Part 1. Otto Eduard Leopold von Bismarck was born on the 1st of April, 1815, at Schönhausen, a village of Brandenburg in the Kingdom of Prussia. The place and date are of interest in the history of the man who was one day to make the greatness of Prussia, the unity of Germany, and the calamity of Europe. Schönhausen, situated about five miles from the right shores of the Elbe and actually in the province of Saxon Prussia, had been the patrimonial residence of the Bismarcks since the sixteenth century. The father and mother of the future Chancellor had there recently undergone a painful ordeal. The 14th of October, 1806, had seen the downfall of the Prussian monarchy. In the words of Heine, Napoleon had breathed on Prussia, and Prussia had ceased to exist. Some days after the catastrophe of Jena, when the distracted Prussians were fleeing before the victors, the Bismarcks had abandoned their estate. Sewell's regiments marching on Berlin had passed through the property and had paid little respect to it. A great genealogical tree hung on one of the walls of the hall. It was the pride of the family, for, in a purely imaginary fashion, it traced the descent of the Bismarcks from the 8th century, from the time of Charlemagne. Sewell's soldiers, showing no respect for this piece of antiquity, had slashed it about with their bayonets, and when the Bismarcks came back to their home, the famous genealogical tree was nothing but a ruin. More than once in his childhood the young Otto heard this episode of the passing of the French recounted. Up to 1815 there had been trying hours at Schönhausen, but the Battle of Leipzig had brought back victory. In 1815, the very year of the birth of Bismarck, one after the other, the Treaties of Vienna and the Battle of Waterloo had consolidated the political and military triumph of Prussia. France, in her turn, under the most stern conditions, was suffering the law of the vanquished. The genealogical tree of Schönhausen was amply avenged. Bismarck used to say, apropos of his origin, that he had in his veins both the blood of a cuirassier and the blood of a professor and expressing it in a different fashion. I come alternately of a generation that gets thrashed and a generation that thrashes. He who at the time of his disgrace was to receive the grade of general of cavalry with the rank of field marshal loved to recall the military character of his forebears. There is not one of my ancestors that did not draw the sword. My father and his three brothers my grandfather was at Rosbach, he fought against Louis the Fifteenth, and my great grandfather fought Louis the Fourteenth in the little wars on the Rhine in 1672 through 1675. Besides, a great many of my ancestors took part in the Thirty Years' War, some for the Empire, others in the Swedish ranks. The family bore this disquieting device, noch lange nicht genug far from being enough. This family, with its military traditions, had been settled for several generations in the middle marches of Brandenburg, which were the cradle of the Prussian monarchy. It belonged to the small provincial nobility, whose whole ideal was to serve in the army and to cultivate their poor estates. They were squirines, Junkers, as the Germans say, with the narrow, conservative ideas and reactionary fierceness the word implies. The Chancellor's father had retired early from military service to employ himself in the improvement of his property. 
he had married Louisa Wilhelmina Menken, who belonged to a family of professors and lawyers. Of this marriage were born six children, of whom only three survived, an elder brother of the Chancellor, the Chancellor, and a younger sister Malvina, who was always greatly attached to him, and who married a Count von Arnhem. Bismarck's childhood was spent on an estate at Kneiphof in Pomerania. The open-air life and a harsh climate helped to develop his powerful frame and gave him the love of the country he kept till the end of his life. I have always had, he used to say, an immense and quite romantic love for the country, for the fields and woods, for uncultivated nature. The only equal passion I have is for animals. His mastiff, Tyrus, was his inseparable companion in his old age. He had been called the Reichshund, the dog of the empire. From his sixth year to his eleventh, the young Otto was brought up in the Plamann Institute in Berlin, a fashionable school, though its iron discipline left unpleasant memories in his mind. According to him, it was a sort of house of correction. Sent later to the Friedrich Wilhelm Gymnasium and then to the Grey Cloister Gymnasium, his studies were of an adequate kind. He gained a fair knowledge of French and English. Later on he learned Russian, and on this account could rightly congratulate himself on being able to treat directly with the ministers of the Tsar without having recourse to an intermediary and without being understood by the other diplomats who could use only French. Bismarck began his thoughts and memories with this view of himself at the end of his secondary studies when he was about seventeen. A normal product of our official teaching, when, at Easter 1832, I left the gymnasium, I was a pantheist. Moreover, if not a republican, I was at least convinced that a republic was the most rational form of government, and in addition I used to rack my brains to discover the motives sufficient to induce millions of men to submit during their whole life to the will of one alone. But these republican and leveling fancies were but a fire of straw. An absolute devotion to the Prussian monarchy had been inculcated on me from the cradle. I remained faithful to the defenders of authority, to the boy imbued with the belief in authority, Harmodius and Aristogiton, as well as Brutus, were common criminals, and William Tell, a rebel and assassin. In a word, the young Junker of Schönhausen belonged body and soul to Prussia, of which it has been said with good cause that it is less a nation than a system, having state policy for its basis, war for its industry, and for instruments the barrack, the school, and officials brought up in the idea that humanity begins only with the baron. In the month of May, 1832, when he was 17, Bismarck was entered as a student in the Faculty of Law at the University of Göttingen. At this time, according to him, he was slender, lean, and as thin as a knitting needle. There would be little to be told of his studies, of his schoolboy pranks, his coarse jests, his duels, there were as many as twenty-eight of them, his eccentricities, much might be said. It is much more interesting to recall that he had definitely taken up his position in the ranks of the reactionary party. I was too well trained à la Prussienne not to be disagreeably impressed by the attempt on the established political order by a revolutionary and noisy crew. It is well to take note of another statement thenceforth imprinted on his mind. If I let my eyes fall on the map of Europe, it maddened me to think that France had kept Strasbourg. His student life came to an end at the Berlin University in 1835 at the age of twenty. Great eater, great drinker, great blusterer, easily made violent and brutal, this giant of more than six feet high, 
gave the impression of a character but ill-balanced, concerned above all in making himself singular by his extravagances. All this seemed unlikely to fit Bismarck for the diplomatic career about which he was vaguely thinking. He consulted Ancillon, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, who absolutely dissuaded him. His appearance was too much against it. Then he fell back upon a judicial career as a temporary makeshift. He made his debut, when he was twenty, at the Berlin Tribunal as a referendary, an office much like that of a registrar. He had to settle divorce matters, and he was not interested in trying to reconcile a drunken husband with a recalcitrant wife. He then took the course of passing the state examination necessary for entering the administrative career, and after this examination he received a nomination as referendary at Aix-la-Chapelle and afterwards at Potsdam. But the passive nature of these duties did not suit his combative temperament. He wrote to his father at that time, The Prussian official is like a musician in an orchestra, he plays the first violin or the triangle without a glance at, or an influence on, the thing as a whole. He must play his part as it is given to him, whether he thinks it good or bad. I want to make music as I think proper, or not at all. The time for military service came. He spent it in the regiment of infantry of the guards. The death of his mother and reverses of fortune abruptly brought about his discharge and a complete change of life. He went to settle at Kneipov in Pomerania to cultivate a family estate. From 1839 to 1847 there were eight years of country life, where, under the roughest conditions, Bismarck led the life of a country gentleman a Landjunker, but he was better pleased with it all than with the business of sorting documents and papers and putting them in boxes. Sooner or later, he said, the moment will come when we shall sink under the burden of our waste-paper habit and shall be crushed by the inferior bureaucracy. At Kneipov existence was hard, with very mediocre resources, the cultivation of an estate that had been well-nigh abandoned had to be undertaken, and everything went wrong, he wrote to his sister. It is with the greatest difficulty that I resist the desire to fill my letter with lamentations over the management of my land, the night frosts, the sick cattle, the poor-looking colza, the dead lambs, the hungry sheep, the scarcity of straw, of potatoes, of manure, and of money. It will be difficult to pull through this year with this bad harvest, prices so low, and this long winter. But to have to grapple with a thousand difficulties suited a nature to which fighting was a need and a pleasure. At this epoch of his life he thus described his ideal. I quite expected to live and die in the country, after gaining some success as an agriculturalist, and after having, perhaps, won some laurels in war if one broke out. If, as a country gentleman, I still had some ambition, it was quite simply to be a brave lieutenant of the Landwehr. The country life he leads continuously develops the great strength of his constitution. He is perpetually scouring his estate on horseback. He trains himself for violent exercise. If I say that I have fallen from my horse fifty times, I believe that would be below the mark. Last time I broke three ribs, and I thought that was an end of me. Twice before the doctor had declared that by scientific rules I ought not to have recovered. His violent exercises, his excesses in eating and drinking, the roughness of his discourse stamped with the most retrograde notions, all these extravagances had gained for him, among his neighbors, the nickname of the mad squire, de Toleunca. But this odd character, built in a fashion very unlike that of the rest of the world, was like a professional in the cultivation of his estate. In spite of a succession of bad seasons, he succeeded 
in drawing from the sterile soil of his moors and pomeranian forests revenues they had not yet yielded this was quite in harmony with the temperament of the junkers who by dint of labour and perseverance had managed to improve the unproductive soil of the north of germany his father died in eighteen forty five when he himself was thirty years old and he went to settle at schoenhausen his birthplace there was still the open-air life the same sort of occupation he was elected captain of the elbe dykes an office which necessitated continual supervision for the elbe in that flat and marshy country divides into several branches of which some mingle with the neighbouring Hafel. To prevent these inundations, it was necessary that the dykes should be kept in perfect order. The new captain conscientiously fulfilled his duties. A letter written at this time may give an idea of his turn of mind. In the summer of 1844, when he was at the sea baths at Nordenay, he wrote his impressions to his dear sister Malvina lest the eye should envy the palate they've put a lady beside me at table whose aspect makes me melancholy and homesick for she reminds me of von pfeiffer at kneipoff when he was at his thinnest opposite sits the former minister z with one of those faces that appear to one in dreams when one is not well he's like a big frog without legs for every morsel he is going to devour, he opens his mouth as far as his shoulders. He looks to me like a traveling bag you open to put something in. When I see this, I'm taken with giddiness, and for fear of falling, I seize hold of the edge of the table. Near me there is also a Russian officer. He is a good fellow, but when I look at his tall, slim figure and his short legs curved like a Turkish saber the thought of a bootjack invariably comes into my head about his thirtieth year bismarck experienced a religious crisis and the vague pantheism he had inherited from his mother gave place to a more precise belief becoming an orthodox lutheran he took to reading the bible and did not fail to receive the sacrament on solemn occasions as in the month of august eighteen seventy when he left Berlin for the campaign in France. In this connection, we may note the profession of his religious faith, which he made one evening at Versailles to the guests at his table. I do not understand how one can live in a well-regulated society and fulfill one's duties to oneself and to others without the belief in a revealed religion, a God whose will is for good, a supreme judge and a future life if i were not a firmly convinced christian if i did not possess the admirable support of religion i should never have been the chancellor you know during his stay at schoenhausen country neighbors had introduced bismarck to the puttkammer family who were extremely pious he had at once noticed the daughter of the house jeanne nine years his junior, and he asked her hand. The father, according to his own expression, felt as if his head had been struck with an axe. Axe or not, the young people were agreed, and the marriage, to the satisfaction of everyone, took place in July 1847. It was a very united and happy household, and there were three children, one girl Marie, who became Countess Rantzau, and two sons, Herbert and William. The year of Bismarck's marriage was also that of his debut in political life. He was then 32 years old. Prussia, as it had been re-established after the treaties of 1815, had all the characteristics of an autocratic and feudal state. Nevertheless, Friedrich Wilhelm III had consented in 1825 to institute provincial assemblies in each of the eight provinces of the monarchy, but nothing could have been less liberal than these institutions. The landed interest alone was represented in them, and that under quite special conditions. Each assembly was isolated, with no communication with the others, 
it had the right of discussion, it could express its wishes, but its power ended there. In a word, it could in no wise compare with the parliamentary functions at that time in use in England and France. The new king, Friedrich Wilhelm IV, who began his reign in 1840, could not be suspected of giving in to new views, but anyhow he understood that it might be opportune to make some concession to liberal ideas. The concession was moderate, and consisted in uniting, under any conditions he might think proper, the eight provincial assemblies in a single diet called the United Diet. This plenary assembly possessed no more efficacious powers. Its setting was a little more solemn, but it was nothing more than a setting. The first of these diets was held at Berlin in 1847. At the opening sitting on the 1st of April, Friedrich Wilhelm made a declaration to the deputies which had nothing equivocal about it. The inheritor of a crown which I received intact and that I ought to and will leave intact to my successors, never will I transform the natural relation between prince and people into a constitutional compact, never will I admit that a written sheet, here is already the scrap of paper dear to Bettmann Holweg, may, like a second providence, interpose between our God and this country to govern us with its paragraphs, and by them replaced the holy and ancient fidelity. It was at this United Diet of 1847 that Bismarck made his debut in politics in consequence of accidental circumstances. Some months earlier, he had been elected in the Landed Interests assistant member to the Landtag in the province of Saxony. He was not intended to sit at Berlin, but the illness of the chief deputy left a vacant place and Bismarck had to fill it. Concerning this period of his life, Bismarck wrote, in his Thoughts and Memories, that he was not imbued with the prejudices of his caste and had never thought that the ancient royal power of Prussia ought to be restored with its absolute authority. Still, it would have been difficult to find a more convinced champion of conservative and reactionary royalty than he, it is always interesting to know the political debut of a man who later on was one of the foremost personages of his time. Bismarck spoke his first words at the sitting on the 17th of May, 1847. An orator on the left had just recalled the rising of Prussia in 1815. He had declared that Prussia had fought then to gain a constitution. A noble people, he said, an enlightened people like the Prussians, knows no national hatred. The assertion was singularly audacious, and the whole history of Prussia gives it the lie. Patriotisms founded on generous sentiments and not exclusive of sympathy with other people are known. Prussian patriotism has never been nourished but by jealousies and hatreds. Bismarck himself was the man of national hatred. He never concealed it. He protested energetically against the words of his colleague of the left. As if the popular movement of 1815, he exclaimed, ought to be attributed to other causes or that any other motive was needed than shame at seeing the foreigner ruling in our country. In my opinion, it would be to render a bad service to the national honor if one allowed that the oppression and humiliation the Prussians had to endure at the hands of a foreign ruler were not enough to make the blood boil in their veins and to stifle every sentiment under hatred of the foreigner. Today these sentiments would evoke enthusiastic acclamations in the Prussian chamber. Then they let loose a tempest. Bismarck was not greatly moved. He took up a newspaper lying on the platform and began to read it quietly. When the storm abated, he finished his speech. From the first, he had not posed as an orator, which he would never be. His style would always be too rough and abrupt. He had set up as a man who frankly spoke out all he thought, not caring in the least to please or flatter, 
a man with whom his adversaries would be obliged to reckon. The first United Landtag separated at the end of two months and a half without having done anything striking. Bismarck, who had just been married, made his wedding journey in the land where the orange tree blossoms. At Venice he met King Friedrich Wilhelm, who sent him an invitation to dinner and lavished attentions on him. He was enchanted with them. It was, in fact, the proof that his political attitude at the Diet had had his sovereign's full approbation. Events soon took a tragic turning. The revolution of the 24th of February, 1848, which had overthrown Louis-Philippe and proclaimed the Republic, had its repercussion almost all over Germany. Bismarck's first move was to get his arms ready, as officer in the Landwehr, to march upon the Rhine, as he wrote to his brother on the 1st of March. But the danger was not on the frontiers. It did not come from France. It was in the very capital of the Prussian monarchy. For several days already Berlin had been the scene of lively agitation in the streets, when on the 14th of March the first barricades were set up. The government remained undecided. The evil grew. On the 18th of March, the revolution was in full swing. There was a regular battle in the streets which were strewn with dead and wounded. General von Pritzwitz posted 14,000 men and 36 guns at the approaches of the castle, the king's residence. But Friedrich Wilhelm seemed terrified at the scenes of massacre whose echoes reached him and gave orders to the troops to retire. Revolution was mistress of the capital. The insurgents, carrying corpses, surrounded the royal palace, calling loudly for the king. The unhappy man came down, passing in front of more than two hundred litters. He bowed down before the dead, and himself, wearing the cockade of the insurrection, he took part in the procession through the streets of Berlin. Bismarck was at Schönhausen when he heard of these events. He had the black and white flag, the flag of Prussia, symbol of loyalty, hoisted on the belfry. He had arms taken from the peasants. One only among his neighbors wished to act for the insurgents at Berlin. Unmoved, Bismarck said to him, You know me, you know I am a peaceable man, but if you do that, I fire upon you. You will not do that, replied the other. I give you my word of honor that I will, and you know I am a man of my word, so keep quiet. He rushes to Potsdam, sees a former minister, Bolschwürg, talks to him of the king. Oh, that Montebank, replies the old minister. But Bismarck is convinced that the king is not a free agent. He makes numerous attempts to gain access to him, but is unsuccessful. Arrived in Berlin, where since the part he took in the United Diet, he is known to many, he takes precautions to put the curious off the scent. He has his cheeks shaved, keeping a long tuft on his chin. He wears a broad-brimmed hat ornamented with the tricolor cockade, black, red, and yellow, the cockade of the German party. With his great height, his hat, his tuft and his dress coat, for he reckoned on being received by the king, he looked odd enough. A street urchin shouted at him, Look, there's a Frenchman. That urchin had not been often in Paris. As for Bismarck, he thought of nothing but a severe repression. He went to see the generals in order to induce them to act. He could obtain nothing. Had not the king himself disclaimed any resistance? Some days later he was at the reception of the officers of the guard in the marble hall and listened with amazement to these words of the king. I have never been more free and safe than under the protection of the citizens of Berlin. Murmurs and the clank of swords were heard, Bismarck reports, such as a king of Prussia had never before heard amidst his officers and will never again hear, so at least I hope. I went back to Schönhausen, broken-hearted. 
End of Section 1《Section 2 of Bismarck by Georges Latour Gaillet, translated by M. Harriet M. Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. A second united diet opened on the 2nd of April, less than a fortnight after the days of March, and again Bismarck sat in it as a substitute deputy it will be supposed that he was set on making his indignant protest heard there. The majority proposed a resolution that resembled approbation of the past. He took up the word. What decides me to vote against the address is the expressions of joy and gratitude with regard to recent events. The past is buried, and more bitterly than many among you, I regret that no human power is able to resuscitate it, the crown itself having cast the earth upon its coffin. But if I accept the fact, constrained by force of circumstances, I cannot break with my customs and words at the united Landtag by a lie, by feigning to be grateful and joyful about that which in my eyes is at the very least a false issue. So strong was his indignation, it appears that tears came into his eyes and interrupted his speech. Before separating, the Diet voted for a project of electoral law with two grades of electors and no franchise conditions. To Bismarck, this liberal measure was a further misfortune, and he described it as the Jena of the Prussian nobility. Despite the gravity of the days of March and their consequences, the interest of German history at this time was much less at Berlin than at Frankfurt on Main. On the 18th of May, 1848, in the ancient Church of St. Paul, a Germanic Parliament, elected by universal suffrage, had been opened. It had for its object the substitution of the unity of Germany for the system of Germanic Confederation, which dated from the treaties of 1815. Composed mainly of professors, the Parliament of Frankfurt listened to the discussion of numerous political theories, but did little other business. At Schönhausen, Bismarck followed these debates with but little sympathy. Some months before, in connection with the Polish riots that had taken place in Posen, he had written that the first impulse of unity and German strength ought to be to wrest Alsace from France and set up the German flag on the Cathedral of Strasbourg. Therefore, all the discussions of the parliamentarians of St. Paul's Church seem to him idle, if not dangerous. If the unity of Germany ever came to pass, it ought not to be through a more or less revolutionary thrust from below, but through political action from above for the benefit of one country Prussia, and that of one dynasty, the Hohenzollerns. In fact, the man who did create the unity of Germany was, and always remained, profoundly Prussian, Prussian to his very marrow. After six months of deliberation, the Frankfurt Parliament had finished by voting for the establishment of a German empire, and for offering the crown of this empire to the king of Prussia, in answer, Friedrich Wilhelm had refused. He could not, he said, accept any crown but that which bore stamp of the seal of God. In replying to the delegates from Frankfurt, he entrenched himself behind the free concurrence of the crowned heads, the princes, and the free towns of Germany, which, for him, was the necessary condition of this transformation. Ten days later, the 13th of April, 1849, Bismarck, who had been elected deputy in the new Prussian chamber, the outcome of the Constitution of December 1848, made this spirited declaration from the Tribune. It is best that Prussia should remain Prussia. As such, she will always be able to give laws to Germany instead of receiving from it such or such others. 
Gentlemen, as a deputy, I have the honor of representing the ancient electoral capital, the city of Brandenburg, which has given its name to this province, the birthplace and cradle of the Prussian monarchy. I feel myself all the more obliged to oppose the discussion of a motion which tends to undermine and overthrow the state edifice built by centuries of glory and patriotism. The crown of Frankfurt may be very brilliant, but the gold which would give it true brilliancy could be obtained only by melting the Prussian crown, and I believe not at all in the success of a recasting in the mould of this constitution. One of his opponents, Baron von Finke, spoke of his antediluvian ideas, as shown by this speech, but he continued to declare himself the champion of reaction. Here is the conclusion of a lengthy speech on the 6th of September, 1849. We are Prussians and will remain Prussians, and I hope that, with God's help, we shall still be Prussians when this piece of paper, the Frankfurt Constitution, will long have fallen into forgetfulness like a dead leaf of autumn. He always preferred the strong hand. The revolution had broken out in the Palatinate. The Bavarian troops were untrustworthy. The only thing he wished for was their open revolt. For then, as he said to the Bavarian minister, the ulcer will be cured at once. If, on the contrary, you come to terms with the hesitating troops, the ulcer will spread inwardly. The more squarely you deal with it, the better. Bismarck was the sort of fellow with whom it was not well to have a dispute. One day in a Berlin restaurant, he heard a drinker speak lightly of the royal family. Out you go, said he. If you're not gone when I've emptied this glass, I'll break it on your head. Which he did. Then, addressing the waiter, he said quietly, Waiter, how much for the broken glass? One day at Sans Souci, he spoke very harshly to the king, accusing him without circumlocution of having evacuated Berlin after the days of March and of having inoculated his people with revolution through the mouthpiece of the royal authority. I no longer believe in the help or support of the king, he said. Parliamentary verbosity was hateful to him. On leaving a sitting of the chamber on the 28th of August, 1849, he wrote to his wife, Our eternal repetitions and decisions are worth no more than the moonlight contemplation of a sentimental young man building castles in the air. He had no wish to imitate the French form of government. In the chamber, he said, The example of France is not very attractive, and truly in the present situation, in 1849, I see nothing to persuade us to clothe our healthy and vigorous body in the Nessus shirt of the French political theorists. French equality is the visionary daughter of the envy and covetousness which for the last sixty years that richly dowered nation has pursued through blood and aberration without being able to reach it. Friedrich Wilhelm was aware of the worth of this rough giver of advice, who spoke his mind on everyone and everything. There had been at one time some question of putting him in the ministry. The king struck off his name and wrote in the margin of the paper, could not be made minister unless the bayonet is to be absolute master. While waiting for the forming of a vigorous ministry, he might be employed in diplomacy. He was sent to the Diet of Frankfurt. In spite of the blow which had shaken all feudal Germany to its depths in 1848, the regime of 1815 was being restored. After having refused the imperial crown, Friedrich Wilhelm had the singular idea of resuming the work of the Parliament of Frankfurt and had brought together in 1850 a Parliament at Erfurt with the mission of examining a new project for the organization of Germany to be called the Limited Union. This Parliament lived hardly a month, and Bismarck, who had been a member of it, did not regret it. 
as Austria had just overcome the revolution in Hungary and Italy, she undertook to re-establish in Germany the system of 1815, which was all to her profit. Schwarzenberg, Francis Joseph's minister, had with Manteuffel, Friedrich Wilhelm's minister, an interview at Olmütz, soon followed by conferences at Dresden. The result of these negotiations was that the old Diet of Frankfurt was revived as in the past. At the time of the Olmutz interview, it could have been thought for a moment that war between Austria and Prussia was imminent, for Schwarzenberg, whose principle was first to discredit Prussia and then to demolish her, had sent a threatening note to Berlin, and Friedrich Wilhelm had given way. One whole party in the Prussian chamber was saying that the honor of Prussia was compromised. There was talk of the humiliation of Olmutz, the retreat of Olmutz. Bismarck, who was one day to tear up the federal agreement and turn Austria out of Germany's doors, made a long speech in approval of what had happened. His feudal sympathies, seeing for the moment but one thing, the defeat of democracy. Prussian honor, in my opinion, he says, does not consist in Prussia playing the part of Don Quixote in Germany. For my part, I hold that Prussian honor must, above all things, preserve itself from all ignominious contact with democracy, and that everything Prussian and Austrian, after a free examination made in common, shall have judged wise and politic, shall be executed in concert by these two protective powers of Germany, having parity of rights in this regard, a war against Austria could be only a war of propaganda and revolutionary principles. Thus spoke Bismarck in 1850. It did not take many months to change his language. What would never change in him was the definition he gave in the same speech. The only wholesome and salutary foundation for a great state is political egotism and not a taste for the romantic. It is certain that a taste for the romantic was never to be an element in the temper of the Iron Chancellor. At the Diet of Frankfurt, Prussia was represented by General von Rochow. Two councillors of legation were to be his colleagues. Bismarck was one of these. The king, undecided in anything, could not prevent himself from saying, you are very courageous to undertake without preparation duties with which you are not familiar. It is your majesty that shows courage in entrusting this post to me, replied Bismarck, and after all, your majesty is in no wise obliged to sustain my nomination any moment when you ascertain that you have nominated a man who is incapable of fulfilling the duties. As for me, I cannot know if the task is above my capacity before I have set to work at it. We will make a trial of it, answered the king. Bismarck had made up his mind to renounce the dream he had written of to his wife about this time. I have a constant fancy which pursues me everywhere. It is to sit in a bare, deep valley in summer heat, my head on your knee, and to gaze at the blue sky and the green tops of the trees through the smoke of my cigar, with you looking at me, and to do absolutely nothing. When will that be? Bismarck's nomination to the Diet was signed on the 6th of May, 1851. It was the beginning of the political career which was going to make him President of the Council of Prussian Ministers and Chancellor of the German Empire. His life as a statesman was to last 39 years. The Federal Diet of Frankfurt was resuming the course of its sittings, which had been interrupted by the events of 1848. At this precise moment, as in the past, it comprised 39 sovereign states. The delegates of these states alone, without any collaboration with the deputies elected by the provinces, formed the assembly as in the past it was put under the presidency of Austria, 
and the vice-presidency of prussia as in the past the machinery of its deliberations was made up of complicated and creaking wheels within wheels with their old ring of scrap iron appearances remained the same the only thing changed was the air it now breathed on the banks of the mine for three years friedrich wilhelm had maintained an ambiguous attitude in harmony with his character but one which had in spite of everything revealed the latent antagonism between prussia and austria he had refused the imperial crown offered him and then he had endeavoured to effect a grouping of the states of northern germany austria had not dissembled her ill temper and prussia humiliated by the backing out of olmutz had consented to the restoration of the old federal law but she had done it under the pressure of a threat and the victory of her rival had left a painful impression far from weakening these feelings of jealousy and revenge were challenged to take a more violent form from the moment when the representative of prussia was like bismarck a fundamentally prussian prussian when bismarck arrived at frankfort he was thirty-six at that age and as we know of far from patient disposition he was not the man to conceal the irritation the pretended superiority of austria caused he had begun by getting rid of his official chief on the fifteenth of july hardly two months after his arrival he himself was appointed chief ambassador then on every subject whether on serious matters or on futile he skirmished with the representative of austria so constantly that at last this representative who was then count rechtberg proposed to settle their quarrel pistol in hand but bismarck quite unmoved gave him to understand that diplomatic affairs were not to be treated according to the rules of duelling then there was the famous incident of the cigar which bismarck loved to relate at the diet the representative of austria president of the assembly alone had the privilege or habit of smoking one day bismarck who was a great smoker took a cigar from his pocket and quietly asked the president count Buhl, for a light greatly astonished Buhl complied the amazed onlookers looked for a great diplomatic incident the news was telegraphed to berlin it was soon an official event two great powers austria and prussia were smoking at the diet in six months time bavaria took to lighting his cigar then saxony then württemberg and soon all the other states followed except hesse darmstadt who thought himself too small a boy austria had lost its monopoly in the matter of tobacco and was on the way to lose more bismarck spent nearly eight years in the diet of frankfurt he had gained a perfect knowledge of the field into which flowed the internal and external statecraft of the germanic body it was he said a run of foxes every outlet of which he knew down to the vent holes heine's epigram on the germanic confederation always came in aptly o bunt du hund du bist nicht gesund confederation thou dog thou art not healthy the very complicated mutual relations of the german states the question of the zollverein affairs in the east which ended in the crimean war and the congress of paris what a field for observation and intrigue for a man who meant to keep himself informed of everything and whose ruling passion was the supremacy of prussia and her dynasty at frankfort this official diplomat conceived the liveliest contempt for diplomacy for bureaucratic diplomacy that is which confines itself to the blackening of paper without any accompanying energetic action he wrote to his wife frankfort is horribly boring picture to yourself a perpetual malicious espionage send me x the cobbler or m from blank and if they were well washed and combed i'd make diplomats of them 
In this case I am making rapid progress in the art of talking much and saying nothing. Each one of us fancies and believes the same of the others, but he is full of ideas and projects, and yet the lot of us altogether haven't a hair's breadth of knowledge as to what Germany will become, any more than we could tell what kind of weather there will be next summer. No one, not even the most malevolent Democrat, has any idea of the incapacity and charlatanism of this diplomacy. At Frankfurt, another idea was making rapid growth in Bismarck's mind, until it completely absorbed it. It will be remembered that he had supported the Olmutz Convention and had been a partisan of the alliance between Prussia and Austria, and here now is Austria, seen at work in the presidency of the Diet, speedily inspiring him with feelings of aversion or rather hatred. Day by day his Prussian patriotism grows greater and more bitter. There is no room in Germany for two equal powers. One must supplant the other. He writes to the minister Manteuffel, his chief, For me, the interest of Prussia is the only essential consideration that ought to weigh in our policy. He was convinced that the dual system upon which the Confederation of 1815 rested was an ambiguous tie which could neither last nor be peacefully loosened. It was a Gordian knot which the sword alone could cut. Shortly after leaving Frankfurt, when he was ambassador at Petersburg, in writing to Herr von Schleinitz, Prussian Minister of Foreign Affairs, he made use of these prophetic words. In our federal position, I see a defect from which Prussia is suffering, and which sooner or later will have to be extirpated, ferro et igne, if it is not remedied while there is still time. That was written in the 12th of May, 1859, that is to say, note it well, seven years before Sadova. About the same date, he wrote again, Up to now the Confederation has been to Prussia a weight and a rope round our neck, a rope the end of which is in enemy hands, which are waiting only for an opportunity to tighten it. And he was not inclined to allow either himself or his country to be strangled. When writing his thoughts and memories much later on, he recalled how he had suffered under that state of affairs at the time. Well, as for me, in so far as I represented Prussian policy, I could not help feeling ashamed and exasperated when I saw that we were renouncing all personal ideas and policies as soon as Austria formulated its demands in a fashion which was not always of the most polite kind. The king shared my impressions more or less, but he had no desire to react by adopting a more far-sighted policy. Bismarck did not spend the eight years of his embassy continuously in Frankfurt. He went frequently to Berlin, where the king liked to consult him on current affairs, whence arose the strong displeasure of the president of the council, Manteuffel, who was jealous of the favor shown him, and saw in him an approaching successor. The king depended on Bismarck's managing the scabby sheep of the right and the noisome goats of the left, but he did not always follow his advice. At Berlin, Bismarck had also frequent interviews with the brother of the king, the future Wilhelm I, and especially endeavored to convince him that Prussia, on the eastern question, had absolutely no reason for making war on Russia. Near Frankfurt, he went at times to visit the old Prince Metternich in his mansion at Johannesburg on the bank of the Rhine. He had won his confidence by making him relate the events of his lengthy career. From time to time, he said, I struck the bell to make it go on sounding, and the ancient chancellor told his little stories. Twice, while he was ambassador at Frankfurt, Bismarck traveled abroad. In 1852, he was sent to Vienna. There was a question of forming a customs and commercial agreement with Austria. The letter in which his master accredited him to the Emperor Francis Joseph, 
said of him that he was honoured by some and hated by others because of his chivalrous loyalty and his irreconcilable opposition to revolution in whatever form. He is my friend and loyal servant. The special mission with which he was charged had no result at the time, but this journey at least allowed him to visit part of Hungary, whence he wrote very picturesque letters to his wife, and above all to see the emperor and the Austrian statesmen at close quarters. He came to the conclusion that Austria did not possess the strength that the success of Olmutz might have made one suppose. The success had been the personal work of a highly energetic minister, Schwarzenberg, who had died in April 1852. Those who had replaced him, Bach, Buhl, Brook, the monosyllabic ministry, were not strong enough to play the same game. Bismarck returned to Berlin with a mass of information about men and things in Austria, which enabled him to be hopeful as to his personal plans. More and more convinced, the longer he exercised his functions at Frankfurt, that a collision between his country and Austria must occur sooner or later, he could face the future pretty confidently. In 1855, an invitation from Count Hatzfeld, the Prussian ambassador to France, called Bismarck to Paris. It was the year of the Exposition Universelle at the Palais de l'Industrie. The siege of Sevastopol was nearly at its end. Under these circumstances, he saw Queen Victoria and Prince Albert in Paris. He was presented to Napoleon III and was present at a fete at Versailles, the arrangements at which seemed to him defective. The days were long past, he said with his Teutonic fatuity, when one could take lessons in politeness and good breeding from France at the court of Paris. The emperor, whom he saw several times, spoke to him of the establishment of a close agreement between France and Prussia. These two neighboring states, placed at the head of civilization by their intellectual culture and their institutions, owed each other a mutual support. Such was, it seems, Napoleon's opinion. Bismarck relates it without comment. But from that moment, he had looked upon the emperor as stupid and sentimental, walking in the midst of the most fantastic ideas. Two years later, the future chancellor again saw Napoleon, when he again went to Paris in order to discuss the settlement of the Neuchâtel question, the emperor talked with him of various projects, always coming back to his idea of a Franco-Prussian alliance. As for him, he listened and found a more and more justifiable opinion of this vacillating and dreamy sovereign. It seems to me, he said at that time to the king of Prussia, that the emperor is an intelligent and amiable man, though he is not so clever as they like to say. Whatever happens is put down to him, and if it rains unseasonably in eastern Asia, they attribute the cause to some perfidious machination of the emperor. Bismarck expressed himself in this fashion a short time after the Congress of Paris, where the government of Napoleon III had been the arbitrator of European peace. He held that there was an overrated opinion of the emperor of the French which did not deceive himself. From Paris, as from Vienna, he brought back personal views which allowed him to have confidence in the future. In the month of October, 1857, King Friedrich Wilhelm, who was showing signs of physical and mental weakening, gave over the administration of the kingdom to his brother for three months. A year later, in October, 1858, his bad state of health obliged him to do still more. He entrusted the regency to his brother. He was brought to sign his own abdication, which preceded his death by about two and a half years. This dynastic change had interesting consequences on Bismarck's career. 
his first relations with the crown prince, the future Wilhelm I, went back to 1835 when he himself was only twenty. After the days of March, when the prince was returning from England, where he had been making a short stay, Bismarck had read to him a poem of the day which was circulating in the army and gave expression to the anger of the soldiers at the time of the evacuation of Berlin, which had been forced upon them. Black, red, and gold, their flag shines in the sun. The black eagle falls, sullied from the staff. Here ends, O Talern, thy glorious story. Here fell a king, but not in battle. No longer do we turn our eyes to the fallen star. What thus thou didst, prince, thou wilt repent. Not one will be faithful as were the Prussians. The prince had been unable to restrain his tears at this humiliating memory. Since then, the two men had had fairly frequent interviews. Bismarck was aware of the far from favorable sentiments of the princess of Prussia, the future empress Augusta, respecting him, but the prince's confidence in him was not disturbed by this fact. He soon received a proof of it in an unexpected way. In January 1859, the regent informed him that he intended to appoint him to the embassy at Petersburg. Bismarck could not forbear setting forth the objections. He was now thoroughly at home on the Frankfurt ground, having worked it for eight years. To take him away from Frankfurt, would it not be to lose the benefit of the position he had gained there? I cannot understand, replied the regent, why you take the thing so tragically. St. Petersburg has always been considered the highest post of Prussian diplomacy, and you ought to accept your nomination as an evidence of my great confidence. Bismarck could but bow to the decision. His nomination was signed the 29th of January, 1859. In the regent's mind, the embassy of Petersburg was but an appointment preparatory to higher office. No doubt he was thinking of giving, after a short delay, the presidency of the council to a man whose great mental qualities and exclusive devotion to the Prussian cause he appreciated. He himself was jealous enough of his authority. One day when he was talking freely with Bismarck of his colleagues, he had said, do you by chance take me for a nincompoop? I shall be my own minister of foreign affairs and my own minister of war. Those are matters I understand. Nevertheless, he felt that the general policy of the realm should be directed by a man who had given the country serious reasons for confidence in him. Why should not Bismarck be that man? When he sat in the legislative assemblies, he had always stood up as an energetic opponent of revolution in all its forms. At Frankfurt, he had gained special mastery of diplomatic questions. A great embassy would put the finishing touch on his authority, and then he could return to Berlin and receive the presidency of the council. So Bismarck, in March 1859, went to represent the government of Friedrich Wilhelm IV or rather of the regent, Prince Wilhelm, at the court of Alexander II. End of Section 2。Section 3 of Bismarck by Georges Lacour Gaillet, translated by M. Harriet M. Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 2. The First Passage of Arms, Part 1. When Bismarck left Berlin to take up his post as the ambassador in Russia, he had to make a long stage of the journey in a post-chaise under very uncomfortable conditions, for at that time, there was no connection between the Prussian and Russian railways. From Königsberg to Biskauv, more than 600 kilometers, Bismarck's carriage rumbled along without a stop 
for ninety-six hours, four days and four nights. This fashion of travelling in snow and cold, which in the night went down to twelve degrees, left him with disagreeable memories. Russia, he wrote, grew longer under our wheels. The versts brought forth young at each halt. The inside of the coach was too low for his great height. He had to make the journey on the outside seat, which was open in front, and he suffered so greatly from the cold that the skin of his face peeled off. But these discomforts were speedily forgotten in the warm welcome he received at Petersburg. It was then the third year after the Crimean War. Gorchakov, who had taken the direction of foreign policy, opined that it was best to keep Russia in peaceful seclusion after this severe shaking, a gentle Philip, in comparison with the actual cataclysm. She needed to retire into herself for some time. As to the Tsar, Alexander II, his predominant sentiment at that moment was animosity against Austria, which power, according to the common saying, had just astonished Russia and the world by its ingratitude, for had it not, in fact, refused to support the empire of the Tsars in the Crimean War, though it owed the suppression of the Hungarian insurrection of 1849 to the intervention of Russia. In consequence, grounds for agreement were speedily discovered between the emperor and the former ambassador to the Diet, who had brought back from Frankfurt distinctly anti-Austrian sentiments. Bismarck found, too, a very favorable welcome from the Dowager Empress, the daughter of Friedrich Wilhelm III and widow of Nicholas I. Of her, he said to his wife, she is of an amiable temperament and treats me with almost maternal kindness. I talk with her as if I had known her from childhood. The character of these personal relations, not to speak of his perfect knowledge of the Russian language, contributed towards at once giving the Prussian ambassador a very strong position. The first year of Bismarck's embassy was marked by a European event of the first importance. France had entered into an alliance with the Kingdom of Sardinia. Napoleon and Victor Emmanuel had combined their armies for the liberation of northern Italy from the Austrian rule. Public opinion in Prussia did not conceal its uneasiness. What was the meaning of this intervention of France? It was the breaking, at short notice, of the treaties of 1815, on which was founded the public law of Europe. A new Napoleon was again making himself the instrument of a policy that was a menace to Europe. The regent gave way before the displeasure of those around him. After the Battle of Magenta, which had decided the fate of Lombardy, he had ordered the mobilization of six army corps, about 80,000 men. After the Battle of Solferino, when the French reached the entrance to Venetia, the military preparations of Prussia were pushed on furiously. The papers were already anticipating a victory on the Rhine and the annexation of Alsace, so the armistice of Villafranca on the 11th of July caused deep disappointment in Prussia. It had been believed that the blow was to have been struck at the hereditary enemy, which had been impossible in 1840. Once again, the sword must be left in the scabbard. At this time, Bismarck did not share this warlike temper, for he was not inclined to play Austria's game in any fashion. On the 8th of May, 1859, he wrote to his brother, If we help Austria to victory, we shall assure her of a position in Italy and Germany such as she has never had since the decree of restitution during the Thirty Years' War and it will need a Gustavus Adolphus or Frederick II to emancipate us afresh. 
we are not rich enough to use our strength in wars that bring us in nothing. Military success seemed to him, at the best, doubtful. If luck goes against us, he wrote on the 21st of July, 1859, to one of his friends at Frankfurt, we shall see the federal states give us the slip and forsake us like the blighted fruit the wind shakes from the tree. Those amongst them, whose capitals have been garrisoned by the French, will make all haste to save themselves patriotically on the raft of a new confederation of the Rhine. So the enforced inaction to which Prussia saw herself reduced was in perfect harmony with his point of view. Bismarck fell seriously ill during his stay at Petersburg. By way of encouragement, a friend kindly told him that the representatives of Prussia either died or went mad. He saw himself on the verge of typhus or idiocy, but his strong constitution and a treatment of Madeira enabled him to get the upper hand again. At Berlin, he had left friends who relied on him for the execution of certain political plans. Among the greatest of these friends was Albert van Roon, who had for long enjoyed a great reputation in military science. In December 1859, the regent had shrewdly called him to the Ministry of War. He was to keep this important office till the end of 1875, that is to say, continuously for 14 years, a thing which is of interest in countries where ministerial instability is, as it were, a principle of political life. Bismarck and Roon had been acquainted since 1835, when one was twenty and the other thirty-two. They had become more and more intimate, as if they had guessed that one day they would need each other for the realization of great plans. For the moment, Roon had decided to undertake the reorganization of the army. As the attempt at mobilization in the summer of 1859 had been but moderately successful, he considered that it was necessary to remodel its rules. He foresaw lively opposition in the Prussian Second Chamber. He was, in consequence, anxious to have at Berlin a fellow fighter in the ambassador at Petersburg, whose great energy he well knew. And he therefore exerted himself to get his friend into the ministry. The head of the military cabinet of the regent, Edwin von Manteuffel, the future general of 1866 and 1870, gave his support to the same candidate and both begged the portfolio of foreign affairs for Bismarck. The regent took the course of asking the ambassador, when on a visit to Berlin, to state before him and some of his ministers the program he proposed to follow. The feeblest side of our policy, said Bismarck, is our meekness toward Austria, who has domineered over us since Olmutz. If, in agreement with Austria, we could settle the question of our influence in Germany, that would be all the better, but that agreement will be possible only when, at Vienna, they are convinced that, in a contrary case, we shall not shrink from rupture and war. It was important to preserve good relations with Russia, for they were valuable to Prussian policy. Schleinitz, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, spoke in his turn. According to him, the real dangers which threatened Prussia came from the West, from Paris and nowhere else. He recalled finally the will of Friedrich Wilhelm III, vanquished at Jena and Tilsit, victor at Leipzig and Waterloo. The regent, son of Queen Louisa, was touched by these paternal traditions. He allowed Bismarck to return to Petersburg. Perhaps Bismarck was not altogether sorry. He wrote to his sister, 
on the 15th of July, 1860. I'm like an old pensioner that has renounced the things of this world or an old soldier, formerly ambitious, who has reached the goal of a good command, and I feel as if I might here wait the ending of my days through many long years of contentment. And again he wrote on the 14th of March, 1861, I don't find the winter so bad as I thought, and I don't ask for any change in my circumstances until, please God, I may go and take my rest at Schönhausen or Rheinfeld and have my coffin made there in leisurely fashion. Meanwhile, the sad existence of Friedrich Wilhelm IV had come to an end on the 2nd of January, 1861. His brother, the regent, inaugurated his personal reign at the age of 64 under the title of Wilhelm I. He had himself crowned with extraordinary solemnity at Königsberg, the capital of the first king of Prussia. Bismarck had assisted at the ceremony and then gone back to his post. His stay in Russia had but increased the inimical feelings which, in his character of a good Prussian, he bore toward everything Polish. Every success of the national movement in Poland, he wrote, is a defeat for Prussia. We can fight this element according to the rules, not of the people's rights, but of those of war. We must look upon Polish sympathies not with humanity, but as an adversary. Between us and the restoration of Poland there is no peace possible. This was for him yet another reason for maintaining good relations with Petersburg, whose hostility to Poland was also a principle of the government. How Bismarck and Prussia kept faithful to this Polish hatred one knows, one knows but too well but how Polish patriotism has succeeded, in despite of every persecution, in maintaining its national traditions and its unquenchable hope of happier days, we know too, and shall know still better when the present war finds its righteous end. In May 1862, Bismarck was recalled from Petersburg and a few days later he was appointed ambassador to Paris. Before this nomination gave prominence to it, in the best-informed circles in Prussia, Bismarck was already looked upon as a man with a great future. A general officer who, as a sub-lieutenant, had joined the École d'Application at Metz in 1861, told us that he had heard Bismarck spoken of under the following circumstances, in the month of February, 1862. The officers of the École d'Application during the winter of every year gave a subscription charity ball at which the German officers of the neighboring garrisons, Saarbrück and Saar-Louis, were present. The Frenchmen received them at their table and talked with them as comrades, one of these foreign officers, the son of a Prussian minister, had a lengthy and serious conversation with our sub-lieutenant. He spoke to him of a man who was beginning to rise and seemed destined for great eminence. He was called Bismarck, a name to remember, and in a confidential vein this officer added, Why should not France make use of Bismarck's influence to contract an alliance with Prussia against their common enemy, Austria. The story is characteristic by its date. It proves that the future Chancellor of the German Empire, as early as the year 1862, was already regarded by his own set as a personage on whom to keep one's eye. The embassy to Paris was, so to speak, a first stage on the way to the ministry which Wilhelm I had arranged for Bismarck. Bismarck only passed through Berlin. On the 25th of May, 1862, he wrote to his wife, How long shall I stay there at Paris, who knows, 
perhaps some months, perhaps some weeks only. Here every one is conspiring to keep me in Berlin, and I shall hold myself lucky on the day when I find at last on the banks of the Seine a spot where I can be quiet and a porter who won't let any one come near me. But once settled in the ancient mansion of Prince Eugène in the Rue de Lille, from the point of view of comfort, all did not appear perfect. The house, he writes to his sister on the 16th of June, 1862, is very well situated, but it is dark, damp, and cold. Its whole aspect is north, and there's a smell of mold and drains. Hatzfeld and Pourtal lived here all the time, but they died of it in the flower of their age, and if I remain in this house, I too shall die sooner than I wish. On the 1st of June, 1862, Bismarck was received officially at the Tuileries in order to deliver his credentials to Napoleon the Third. He received me in a friendly manner. He is good-looking, has become a little stouter, but has not grown fat or aged. The Empress is still one of the most beautiful women I know, in spite of St. Petersburg. She has, in fact, become still more beautiful during these five years. Bismarck was invited to Fontainebleau by the Emperor, and walking in the Jardin de Diane, the two men discussed political questions. The Emperor asked his guest point-blank if he thought the King of Prussia was inclined to enter into an alliance with him. Bismarck took refuge in a polite and evasive answer. The emperor made a fresh attempt and spoke of the advantages of a diplomatic alliance. But Bismarck, who knew how opposed his king was to any rapprochement with France, was greatly embarrassed. In face of the emperor, he said, I was like Joseph before Potiphar's wife and one knows, in fact, that the attitude of the son of Jacob and Rachel was one of extreme awkwardness in face of the ardent advances of the Egyptian woman. The Fontainebleau interview had no results, though at least, coming after those of 1855 and 1857, it allowed the Joseph of Schönhausen to study the character of his interlocutor and to divine the vagueness and indecision of the thought that could thus lay itself bare, heedless of precautions. In this same interview, the emperor declared that before long there would be a rising in Berlin, a revolution in the country, and that the king would have the entire nation against him if he attempted a plebiscite. And Bismarck made this somewhat impertinent reply. Our people don't build barricades. In Prussia, kings alone make revolutions. This was the emperor's verdict on Bismarck. He is not a serious man. On his side, asked by a Russian diplomat what he thought of Napoleon III, Bismarck answered in the words of La Fontaine, De loin c'est quelque chose, et de près ce n'est rien. Seen from afar, he is something. Seen near, he is nothing. The ambassador had not much to do in Paris at this season. For amusement and instruction, he set forth on a journey over France. Chambord and the castles on the Loire, Bordeaux, Bayonne, Biarritz, whence he pushed on as far as Saint-Sébastien, Pau, Lourdes, Cotteret, Bagnères, Luchon, Toulouse, saw the passing of this traveller enchanted at living his own life and delighted with the scenes which France offered him, especially in the region of the Pyrenees. While on his way he had news of Berlin through Rune. The king was still hesitating over his decision, but the ambassador's friends were still importunate. The pear is ripe, said one laconic dispatch. At Paris, he found another dispatch signed with an assumed name, Periculum in Mora, make haste. He delayed no longer. The next day, the 19th of September, he left for Berlin. His embassy to France had lasted four months in all. 
the whole interest of this flying visit no doubt centred for him in the fontainebleau interview when a few short hours had let him see as man to man what the emperor of the french was bismarck arrived at berlin in the midst of a political crisis in february eighteen sixty Roon had set forth his scheme for military reorganization since then relations had become more and more strained between the government which approved of the plan and the second chamber which dreaded an excessive extension of militarism Roon had won only some support by speaking of an attempt at reform of a temporary nature but the attempt was not long in taking the character of a definite organization the chamber had wished to protest and had been dissolved in march eighteen sixty two a new chamber animated by the same spirit had first in september refused the credits asked for the reform of the army roon had not waited for this vote to telegraph to his friend that there was danger in delay and bismarck had hastened back wilhelm i was convinced of his rights but worn out as he was by the difficulties which had only increased for two years in thinking that a younger monarch might more easily get out of them he had made up his mind to leave the throne to the crown prince who was one day to be the emperor frederick the third however he consented to have on the second of september another interview with bismarck who had just arrived i will not govern he said unless i am in such a position as to do so in the way for which i can answer to god to my own conscience and to my subjects but i cannot do it if i am to govern according to the will of the present majority of the landtag and i no longer find ministers who are inclined to direct my government without submitting themselves and me to the parliamentary majority therefore i have decided to give up my sovereignty and i have already prepared my act of abdication actuated by the motives i have pointed out he showed bismarck the document who replied that he was ready to enter the ministry and that he was confident that with ruin he could constitute a stable cabinet are you prepared said wilhelm to support as minister the reorganization of the army yes sire even against the majority of the landtag even against the majority then it is my duty to attempt the continuation of the struggle with you and i will not abdicate the interview was prolonged and bismarck confirmed wilhelm i in his decision by this emphatic declaration i would rather perish with the king then forsake your majesty in the fight against parliamentarianism the king threw the act of abdication aside and tore up a program in which he had made some concessions to the liberals that same evening bismarck was appointed minister of state and provisional president of the ministry the future chancellor and the future emperor had thus linked their destinies by a bond that death alone was able to sever twenty-six years later bismarck's entry into the ministry was received ill by the second chamber of the landtag which looked upon him as a pure reactionary the first words he spoke before a commission increased this displeasure when on the discussion of the budget he was heard to claim equal rights for the king the first chamber and the chamber of deputies a propos of general policies he had added germany does not look for the liberalism of prussia but for its strength bavaria württemberg baden may be favourable to liberalism that is why no one will assign to them the role of prussia the great questions of the day will not be settled by speeches or the decisions of the majority that was the great mistake of eighteen forty eight and eighteen forty nine but by iron and blood durch eisen und blut iron and blood 
iron and fire in latin or german one recognizes the brutal formula his familiar formula bismarck thought that the words he had spoken on the thirtieth of september eighteen sixty two might have been used against him with wilhelm and he was right having gone to meet him when travelling and getting with him into an ordinary first-class carriage he found him visibly depressed the king was still under the impression of his talks with queen augusta bismarck wanted to explain his words but wilhelm interrupted him i foresee exactly how it will all end down there in the open plots beneath my windows they'll cut off your head and then a little later mine bismarck simply answered and after that sire well after that we shall be dead yes vehemently retorted bismarck after that we shall be dead but one must needs die sooner or later and could we perish in a worthier way as for me i should die fighting in my king's cause and your majesty in sealing with your blood the royal rights conferred on you by god whether it be on the scaffold or on the field of battle nothing could alter the honourable fact that we should have gloriously risked life and person to defend the rights granted by the grace of god your majesty must not think of louis the sixteenth in life and death he showed weakness and he does not make a fine figure in history but does not charles i always remain an august historical figure when after having drawn the sword for his rights and lost the battle he was still inflexible sealing with his blood his ideal of his royal rights your majesty must fight you cannot capitulate you ought to resist the violence done you even were your person in danger as he listened to his minister eighteen years his junior speaking with such authority and energy the king of sixty-five was transfigured once more he became the prussian officer ready to fight to the death for the monarchy and the fatherland the conversation in the badly lighted railway carriage continued in the same strain and when they reached the station at berlin wilhelm was in a serene state of mind one might even say lively and bellicose the minister had permanently reconquered his king End of section three